Um, some people may know about some of the things that we're going to be talking about, some may not. So it will be a good education. But I do believe since we live in Central Florida, we should know how it came to be, the people that were instrumental and what happened to those that did not make it. And we're going to begin with Pamela Schwartz. She's the chief curator for the Orlando Regional History Center. And <clears throat> pardon me, and her story is a, is a gripping one, a disturbing one. It's the retelling of the disastrous 1920 Ocoee Election Day Massacre. Pamela? Okay. Hey, thank you. Uh, to make sure that I am respectful of our other uh, plant speakers' time, how much time do I have? You have like 35 minutes, 40 minutes. All right. We'll see what we can do. Okay. Um, so um, a minor update to my bio there. As of 9 a.m. this morning, uh, I'm the executive director of the Orange County Regional oh. History Center. So that's new news. Uh, I was appointed by Mayor Demings this morning. So. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Um, we currently have at the museum uh, since October uh, an exhibition called Yesterday This Was Home, the Ocoee Massacre of 1920. Uh, we've had uh, this exhibition open. It will be open now through April 4th. It has been extended. And so we hope, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a, of a preview and an overview, but this is the really short version of this tour. I can give you up to a five and six hour tour through this exhibition, depending on interest level. And so I, I would really invite everyone uh, who's here to hopefully get interested uh, and be willing to come to the museum and, and to be able to learn more and take it in sort of at your own pace and your own interest. Um, but to give you a little bit of, a, of an overview, we've been working on this exhibition for over three years. It's by far uh, and large our most in-depth research endeavor that we've ever done. Um, this is an exhibition that our institution actually turned down 20 years ago because of its difficult content. Uh, it took another 20 years <laughs> for our, uh, our to be having the staff and be in the place that our institution was willing to, to tackle this really difficult history. And so we began uh, planning. And one of the things about the Ocoee Massacre, I'm guessing most people here probably have at least sort of a fundamental understanding of the event. If not, We'll get to that. Um, but one of the things about the Akoi massacre is that there's an extraordinary lack of information about the event. It was intentionally obfuscated. Um, what information is out there is often misinformation or is unverifiable at best. And so when our staff undertook this, um, when an entire community is, is um, ransacked, there's murder, a community is, is largely burned to the ground, there's not a lot to tell an, uh, to, to fill an exhibition with. Right? When, when people scatter and the, the community's gone, it's not like we have artifacts and different things to put on that exhibition. Uh, and so we decided that we wanted to provide a broader context to this event. Events like the Ocoee Massacre or like Tulsa or Rosewood events you might be more familiar with um, simply don't happen in a bubble, right? They're not isolated, they're not accidental events. They come from a long line of different uh, steps in a timeline. And so we started to talk ourselves back from the Ocoee massacre that happened in November 2nd and 3rd, 1920. And we kept backing up and backing up and backing up to try to find what was that initial event that allowed for something like the Ocoee massacre to happen and to happen here in Central Florida, not elsewhere, right here in our own backyard. We got all the way back to the 1500s with the first forced enslavement of Africans brought to this country because it started in Florida. It didn't start anywhere else. It started here in St. Augustine. And so we started looking at themes and we carry all the way from that initial enslavement up through the Okoye massacre. And then we looked at where does the legacy end on this event? And we kept going and we kept going until we got all the way up to today. And so we go from enslavement up through the, the most recent iteration of the Black Lives Matter and the ongoing version of the Black Lives Matter movement with the, the murder of uh, George Floyd and also on to the election of November 2020, 100 years, 100 years later. So I'm going to attempt to go ahead and share my screen. And what I'm going to do is just offer kind of just a, a cursory walkthrough. Um, I'm gonna allow this to sort of play pretty quickly because uh, again, I'm not gonna be giving you a full tour. We don't have time for that. Uh, but to give you sort of a, a, a broad background and a few of the Easter eggs about how we uh, design the exhibition. So you'll see a lot of really rich colors. You see this beautiful wood that was all hand distressed, cut, burned as we go throughout by our staff. And we wanted to choose this rich color palette to really elevate the stories and the people that we feature uh, within. 
So we ended up again with a, a sort of a three-part exhibition, pre-ACOE, ACOE, post-ACOE. The exhibition is fully bilingual in order to be the most accessible as possible. Uh, we also created a youth and family guide for young learners. We recognize that this really difficult content can be difficult for people to want to bring their families to, and especially when they have um, young ones. And so we've written a guide, um, and that was spearheaded by one of our staff who formerly worked at the 9-11 Museum in New York. And so she has a lot of experience in, in doing this. So as we move through the exhibition, um, like I said, we'll just kind of keep walking you see on the right, that's a voting booth. Uh, we have these booths placed in five places throughout the exhibition. Uh, they're intended to allow the visitor, the patron to dig a little deeper in the content. One of those asks you whether you think the family's uh, descendant of a Koei should receive reparations. One asks about uh, reinstore, uh, reinstating voting rights uh, for individuals who've been formerly incarcerated. One of the things you'll see here is this text panel right in the middle. Um, what that is is a how to do this exhibition. Uh, that's not something we would normally do uh, in our exhibits, but in this case we chose to do that um, for a variety of reasons. Um, given all that's been happening in the world, um, we needed to try to find uh, and sorry, this is a little bit blurry in the in-between here, but we needed to try to find a way to address different populations and different demographics across periods of history. Do we use the racial identifier of African, African American, because people don't become African American until there's an America for Florida, right? Um, or do we use black? And so overall, uh, you'll see the first text panel, we did use the word African because those are the very first individuals who come here. Uh, but throughout the exhibition, we chose to use black because we also can't speak to the individuals within this exhibition, uh, how they would like to be identified. Uh, you'll see a variety of definitions throughout the exhibit. If, if people go through this entire exhibition and read nothing but those definitions, we will have hopefully made a difference. Uh, and you'll see those terms as we, as we go along. So this area is where we start again in the 1500s um, with that sort of uh, first enslavement that really sets the pace. That's where the systems begin, the systems of oppression, the systems of racial terror, uh, these things that continue for hundreds of years. And so just in this tiny fell swoop of this little space, we actually go from the 1500s all the way up to the Civil War. Uh, <laughs> we have to cover a lot of history in a small space. Um, and what does everybody learn about the Civil War? 1865, the war ends, we've got the Emancipation Proclamation and all the, the people who had been enslaved are now free. Well, that's not really the case. Freedom wasn't free uh, for these individuals. They're of course walking out of this bondage um, with no money, with few resources, often not even their literacy with which to build on. And it's incredible to read some of the stories uh, of, of how people were able to begin to start to uh, rebuild their lives from scratch in, in this, this place. Um, we, we really wanted to use a lot of large photography too to also draw people into these, these um, topics uh, and to, to show some of these highlights throughout our history. So this particular photo is actually a, a black family in the 1870s. So that's just five years after emancipation and they've got this home and they're, they're working to build. But I reiterate that freedom wasn't really free. As we move into the next section of the exhibition, uh, we talk about black codes uh, and Jim Crow laws and all of these things that started to get written in legally into the system to start to strip away the different freedoms that, that black people had finally come to, to recognize. Um, for instance, you see in front of you, these are some of the founders of Eatonville, which is the, the oldest black community in America. And somebody could be in that status. And then literally overnight, they could find themselves more likened to the photo on the left. Now, this was, again, part of that system. There are black codes written in that say things like anybody wandering about uh, looking like they're leading an idle uh, life can be arrested. Now, it didn't say this law was for black individuals or the black population, but that's the reason it was written. And what that did was allow places like the state of Florida to literally pick anybody up anywhere that looked like they might be able to work. In this case, look at your brick roads throughout Central Florida, the turpentine companies. It was all part of how the state made money and really built the state on free labor um, through this incarceration system. 
coming up through the 1800s into the early 1900s, you're seeing this constant push and pull um, of, of history. Now, now, keep in mind, these are things that are happening nationally, they're happening statewide, but also very much regionally and locally. Um, you see uh, these amazing <laughs> figures like Ms. Mary McLeod Bethune, who starts a school for Negro girls and does so much incredible work. She stands down the Ku Klux Klan, which of course is on the rise in white supremacists, which is what you see on the next text panel. Anytime there's progress when it comes to um, equitable rights for people of color in this country, that rise of white supremacy rears its ugly head. We've seen that all too recently. Many of the things you'll see me mention or hear me mention like incarceration, education, labor, property, these are all different ways that people can rise to prosperity. They're also the ways they can be oppressed at the hands of um, laws and often uh, the Ku Klux Klan because many of the local law enforcement uh, and politicos of that time period were major players in the Ku Klux Klan. Again, moving through all of this really very quickly, um, we, we start to bring the time period up to 1920, the 1920 election. Now there's a lot of stuff going on in this country, but it's also those same things that are happening locally. Um, a few key factors that really, you know, I call it a simmering pot, a few key factors that are really sort of um, in this pot and making it boil faster and faster. You've got the end of World War I, which really changes the economy. You've got a lot of young black men who've gone off to fight. And there's a couple of things that happen. Not only have they served their country the same way, and should come home to those same rights. And not to say that there's no racism in Europe, but it certainly wasn't like the treatment here. And so they saw that life didn't need to be like it had been before they'd gone to war. All the while, these people are off and you've got this immensely strong population of black women who are moving and shaking. You just saw Miss Mary McLeod Bethune and Ida B. Wells Barnett and these people who are making it happen because of course, we're also leading into women's suffrage and the first time that women are gonna to get to vote. And now that's not just white women, that's also black women, which is a whole new voting block for this, this, uh, this region, right? And for the, the nation. So there's also a black voter registration drive. At the time, it was a democratic state, the state of Florida. Uh, and if you know your politics, you know, of course you all know your politics. Um, <laughs> they were sort of flip-flopped in, in view. And so the idea was this large black voter registration drive to try to swing that vote. You'll see this excellent uh, image of women's suffrage. There's some really great quotes uh, actually um, which I can't read to you verbatim, but um, a, a black activist, uh, Mary Eliza Church Terrell, uh, in terms of looking at enfranchising uh, women voters said, how will you relish the idea of being jostled in an election booth by your cook or washerwoman who will have as much right there as the white women who employ them? So that's kind of a call to action um, to, to the, the black population to get out, but especially women to vote. Uh, there was a white politician who said something very similar, uh, which said, uh, if the white woman would not register, they would be ruled uh, by their cooks and wash women. That's a threat. Mm -hmm. That's trying to get white women out and trying to make them believe that they will actually be outnumbered. This area also uh, looks at voter disenfranchisement. It looks at all of the insidious ways that the white community tried to, to tamper down the black vote. Literacy tests uh, that are impossible to pass. That voting station that we made that we just went by has a, actual questions from a Southern literacy test on it. And nearly, I don't know that I've actually seen anybody pass it uh, in this day and age. And of course that wasn't administered evenly amongst people. Poll taxes, we've got a white primary ballot and an actual um, white primary ballot locally. I've just gone through 500 years of history in just a few minutes, um, <laughs> but we're going to move on now into the Ocoee section, and that's all leading up to the 1920 election. But we have to step back just a touch um, from that to be able to understand about Ocoee. Now, Ocoee, um, of course, there were indigenous cultures and native cultures that were living in this area um, far before any white settlers. Uh, but around the 1850s, a man by the name of Dr. James D. Stark comes. He brings with him 23 individuals whom he has enslaved and begins an agricultural pursuit. By 1865, you see a variety of white Confederate veterans moving into this area. Uh, one of them is Captain Bluford Sims who buys up tons and tons of land. All during this time, white people, black people, everybody is are really moving around. Everyone's trying to figure out their life after the Civil War and rebuild through reconstruction. 
Now, by 1885, we know that there's several uh, Black families in Ocoee. Now, they're, they're renting and they're living on the property of this man, this white man, Captain Bluford Sims, and they're working for him. The Normans, the Perrys, the Hightowers, the Hammeters. Take note, 1880s, 1890s is when these families start to buy their own properties. Something to say about this, I think a lot of times people think of a Koei massacre and they think of these young people getting in fights over, over a variety of things. These people had been neighbors for 30 years. These weren't new neighbors. These weren't young people. Bluford Sims was in his 90s when the actual massacre happens. So it's just something to take into context as we move through the story. All of those things we mentioned that were happening sort of nationally and regionally were of course also happening to Ocoee. Um, they sent you know, plenty of men off to the war. Um, you'll notice these uh, photographs of these two men here in the center of the wall. Um, with all of the different tactics to disenfranchise voters um, and to try to overrule all of the, the, the legal, the legalities and things of politics, um, imagine the intimidation for the black community with the rise, this ongoing rise in white supremacy. Uh, but these two men you see here, uh, uh, attorney W.R. O'Neill and Judge John Cheney are very affluential white Republicans in the community at the time. And they were out providing lectures to the black community. How do you register? How do you pay your poll tax? Whether they believe black people should be voting or whether they just wanted their Republican votes, we'll probably never know. But what we do know is that about a month before the massacre, this right here, we have the original in our collection. They received a letter from the Florida Ku Klux Klan. I'll summarize that long letter to you. And what it says is stop, stop what you're doing or else do not enfranchise black voters. We have always enjoyed white supremacy in this country and we will continue to do so. That letter is copied to the local Ku Klux here in the Orlando area and it says, watch these two. That kind of intimidation and those threats, they weren't trying to hide it. If it's that way for white affluential community members, imagine how the black community must have been feeling. Next to that are newspaper articles. There were Ku Klux Klan marches of 500 people strong in full regalia just days before the massacre through the streets here, Daytona Beach, Jacksonville, other places, all with that same message. If you're black, don't even try to vote or else. As our staff tried to start this process, we tried to figure out, okay, as historians, what can we even factually say about this event? There's so much misinformation out there. And so what we did is, um, this actually started as a part of our research project, but we took 100 and this whole wall, it's 32 pages of text, if you wanna put that into a smaller context. We took 129 different versions of the story of the Ocoee massacre, and we put them in line by the facts. So how many people were killed? Where did that person go next? What happened then? And we put them all with their source citations together. And if you've ever read or seen one of those like choose your own adventure novels where you're reading the book and then you have to decide, okay, if you wanna go down the dark hallway, go to page 48. If you wanna go outside and have a picnic, go to page 72. This is how this reads. There are so many versions. And if you really took the time to sit and read this in the exhibition and people have, you start to see where it gets twisted. Now, what does this remind you of? One story, 129 versions. Very much like today with fake news. There wasn't even Twitter back then. Imagine how large and twisted the story would have been. Um, so all of these different versions, some of them have validity and some don't. But that screen you'll see a little bit better in a moment is actually a resources screen. You can go and any one of the 129 versions, if you look at the wall and you say, who said that? That doesn't even make sense. You can go and you can read the newspaper article, listen to the oral history, watch the video, whatever that source is. And think to yourself about the validation of that information. Is this fake news? Who said it, when they say it, how they say it? So this went from being a research exercise for us to being one of our largest display methodologies because it really shows you how easily misinformation can spread and how quickly. From those 32 pages, we decided to boil it down to only this white text. And what you see here on the wall, this white text, is only what all 129 accounts agree upon or what we can actually prove through uh, primary resources. And when we pull that text out, these four paragraphs are what we're left with. 
These are the only four paragraphs that we can verifiably and factually say about this event. It doesn't mean some of the things on that other wall aren't true. It just means this is all that can be proven. So I'll just summarize that on November 2nd, 1920, Moses Norman, a black labor broker and a citizen of Ocoee, went out to try to um, vote. He's turned away. Now there's a lot of versions of what might've happened next, but none of them are verifiable and they're all in contention. Um, but later that night, an armed white mob of deputized men shows up at the home of July Perry, another labor broker and black man in Ocoee. And shots ring out and violence ensues. I'll spare all of those details, um, but <laughs> there's a lot we don't really know, but we do know that at the end of the night, a large portion of that black community has been burned to the ground and an unknown number of black individuals have been murdered. One of those is July Perry, who is actually taken from a uh, after being shot, taken to the jail in Orlando, just a block here from the history center. And he is brutalized and lynched. Now we also account for three other black individuals we know were killed. Now numbers range as far as 600. Now not even 600 black people lived in a It was only around 280 people that we can currently account for. But those other three black individuals that we account for is because we have a Carrie Hand Funeral Home Undertaker's Memoranda that states three black individuals who had burned to death were put in pauper's caskets and buried. Now, part of the story is how little legal information and documentation actually exists. So why does that one document actually exist? It also happened to be a receipt for $33. Somebody wanted to get paid for that service. Otherwise, I would venture to say that it wouldn't exist either. After this event, an unknown number of black people have been murdered. Many of their homes burned to the ground, though not all. Two white men of uh, those officers have died. And the community of Ocoee um, for the next 50 years essentially remains an all white sundown town um, until the 1970s. Now we can't sort of go through every single bit of information about this event. Obviously there's a ton of things you see from this wall, um, but we do select a few different things um, that we really hone in on the exhibition that we find are, are important. And one of those is the loss of prosperity and generational wealth from the black community. These individuals were either renters or there's about 50 families renting and about 27 who were land owning. Now, everybody living in Ocoee that night lost some, something. Whether they owned their property or they didn't own their property, they still lost a home and their possessions and their, their sense of safety. Uh, one of the biggest things we undertook was land deed research. We took over 200 land deeds. And if you've ever seen a land deed, they're not easy to read. Uh, and they're not easy to transcribe in old handwriting. Excuse me. Uh, and uh, they provide a lot, they, they do have a lot of content. So we transcribed over 200 land deeds and painstakingly mapped them and made this digital interactive map. And so I'm going to pop out of this a second and show you. We have it on our website, so you can go and explore this a little bit more. Um, but the idea behind this was a land deed, while a primary resource, doesn't give you the full view of a transaction. There's this thing called OVC, Other Valuable Considerations. So I might have given you $10 and 23 cattle, but not all of that is on the land deed. So while we'll probably never really know how much it was sold for, how much it was purchased for, though we know it was at a great loss, we can find out what those properties are worth today. So you'll recall November 1888 is when some of these individuals uh, start, the black families start moving into the city of Ocoee. As I drag through this timeline, you'll see blue equals white land ownership and yellow equals black land ownership. So you'll watch this 30 year building, building, rise in prosperity, rise in wealth for the black community until we get to the point of the massacre in 1920. Again, these people have been in this community for 30 some years. Notice it's all mixed up. There's not a black side of town and a white side of town. And we don't even know where the 50 families who were renting lived. But this is approximately the black land ownership at the time of the Ocoee massacre. And in this exhibition, if you come up, you can click any one of these properties and you can see what we know. So John and Lucy Hickey, a black couple, purchased this property in 1911 from a white couple for $200, 1911. They're forced to sell the property just 17 months after the massacre to a white man for $5. That's a 99% loss. That property today would be worth $715,000. This family, 
Robert Hickey, the descendant, is coming from New York on Monday to tour this exhibition with me. I've given tours to over 33, I think, of the Hickey family members. Now, these are not generations removed families. These aren't fourth and fifth grade grandparents. His grandfather that raised him is John Hickey, and he should have passed to him well over $1.3 million in property and generational wealth. We know the properties are worth well over $10 million. If you come to the exhibition, we can't evaluate all of the properties. We don't know what this one is worth. And why is that? Because today it's baseball diamonds in the city of Ocoee. We can't even evaluate, there's highways running through it, right? But what we know is that the generational wealth lost by the black community that night at the hands of white perpetrators is worth well over 10 million. Again, a 30 year rise in prosperity and then watch in just the next six years. So the story's always gone that the black community left immediately. And we know that that's not true. Many tried to stay. All of the properties were being dumped into the market and it drove the prices down. Some people, all of their, their money, everything was wrapped up into these properties. A 30 year rise and watch in just six years, the black community was decimated and gone. We talk about the properties because there is some primary source documentation. And this is very important for the families to know and understand. There's a lot more to the story. I have to keep moving along. We talk about other, more things about the land and it's more, more nuanced. We talk about the deaths, the death of July Perry of the other black individuals and how we'll never probably know. We talk about the relationships of the black community and the white community and the black and white community together. Um, but uh, a couple other points on the, in the ACOE section before I sort of move out of it um, is that the story had gone that the black community left never to return for 50 years. It was actually way worse. The white perpetrators did not accomplish all they had set out to do. The black community didn't leave, at least not right away. A year later, a man by the name of George Betsy, which happens to be July Perry, you'll recall was Lynch's brother-in-law, he had been shot in the leg during the massacre. He had healed, he'd moved into the Paramore area, of course, another uh, historic black neighborhood. He's called in on an anonymous tip for bootlegging. He's of course taken by a lynch mob from the officer who comes to get him. That officer is none other than the same officer who brought July Perry from Ocoee to the city of Orlando jail when he was taken by a lynch mob. George Betsy's taken by a mob. He's found days later by the sounds of his screams. He's been stripped naked, beaten to death, painted red and white striped with a bag over his head. When they find him, because he survives, he says they told him he'd been talking a little too much about what had happened at Ocoee last November. There was an intentional will to cover it up, to continue to obfuscate the information because when people talk, then investigations have to happen. Likewise, just a month after that, black um, there are white people throwing black, or excuse me, White, five white men are throwing dynamite into black people's homes in a Koei. Now you might be surprised to find that five of those people were arrested and two were found guilty. After the Koei massacre happens and nobody's held responsible whatsoever, the home was owned by a white man. It was for black people were boarding. Otherwise I imagine that would not have been the case. There is some investigation done after the Koei massacre but ultimately nobody's held responsible. And many of those legal documents um, that were supposedly actually held by our own local governments have gone missing, just like with Rosewood. For both of these terrible massacres, the grand jury is gone, the grand jury report. This event isn't over. It continues to impact these families. Uh, we wanted to very much make sure that they were able to share their story. And so we have found, like I said, I think about 10 descendant families, uh, but over well over 75 actual family members of the families who were black that lived in Ocoee at the time. Uh, and we talked to them and we did oral histories and we wanted to make sure to share part of their story. What is the legacy for them? What do they feel about the loss of generational wealth and the fact that their families went through this event? Uh, we talk about, we start with July Perry's family. Uh, he's pictured here on the right, on the left is his daughter, Caritha, who was a teenager at the time. Here she is much, much older, pointing at the, the scar of the bullet wound in her arm from that night. Um, there's a lot to the Perry story. I won't go into it. Do see the exhibit. If you're interested, follow up. I'll be happy to talk to you about it. Their land is given executorship to that earlier, I mentioned, white Confederate veteran, Bluford Sims. 
it's caught up in all sorts of legalities for 12 years. It's not till 12 years later, July Perry's gone. Estelle and Caritha have been left with nothing, no money, no patriarch, no anything. 12 years later, each of the six descendants receive $125 each. These properties that July Perry owned were sold for thousands when the property, as you saw, of the black community were sold for mere fives of dollars. We try to break down this entire story here. You'll just have to read about it. Um, we do go on to talk to about the sub, several other families. We have quotes from them on the wall. We wanted to show the pictures of the people who survived this. We didn't want them just to be names and acreages and numbers on the wall. We wanted to show that these were people who had families and dreams and somehow went on to build after this as well. As I mentioned, there's a lot more to this story. This is the short version of the tour. Um, but in the 1970s, some diverse communities do attempt to come back into Ocoee after it had been a white sundown town. One of the individuals we uh, interviewed was 13, a young black man uh, who was 13 living in Apopka and his family moved back to Ocoee in the 1970s. And he likened the experience to being like sticking his finger in an electrical socket. Was, uh, they were traumatized at the way that people treated them just for being black. It was like they'd been punished and not knowing what they had done. Going on from the Ocoee section, I'll go through this last part quite a bit more quickly, but it wasn't an isolated event. And it wasn't the only of its kind. You'll see lists and lists on this wall of other events that happened in America, um, different you know, mass murders um, and uh, events of racial terror. In the center of this wall here, is a list of all the what we know to be lynchings uh, of the black community in our region. Now they say the last one was in the 50s with Melvin Womack and I would say that that's not the case. We just again call it something different now. Um, but these are all mostly obfuscated. There's very little information about these individuals. We feature this as a six foot touch screen map that you can explore that all of those other dots, uh, sorry it's blurry, show not only the black community throughout America, but Latinx, his, um, Italian, and other individuals who have often um, had experiences with racial terror and lynching. And you can click any one of these individuals and learn more about them. The idea again being that this has been an ongoing process. Just a few years after a COE happens, you've got the Rosewood Massacre. Um, one thing I find a little jarring, if you're local and have um, been inside the Bob Carr Theater, they used to be called the Municipal Auditorium. This photograph here is hard to tell, but these are all Ku Klux Klan members. This is 1928, after Okoe, after Rosewood. And it's appropriate for all of them and all of the political figures. The mayor came and gave the opening address at this Ku Klux Klan rally, which also included a circus for the Boy Scouts. Um, so this is just to put into perspective the 1920s. We move up through the 1930s to the 1950s and 60s. This is a, a era in this Central Florida history that the FBI, the FBI actually refers to as the reign of terror. That's how bad it was here. Um, the Groveland Four, I, I won't go into this story, we don't have time, you're probably a little more familiar with that. Uh, there's the bombing of the Cremet uh, on OBT. Of course, they, there's a, uh, an ice cream custard stand that refused to segregate their counter um, and was bombed. There's a series of night rides from the Ku Klux Klan uh, that take many black men out and, and murder them. Uh, this photograph you can't really see is Albert Boykin who does uh, survive, but narrowly. We feature Walter White, uh, who is actually a, a very fair skinned black man who would pose as a white individual at these different events to try to gather information for the NAACP. Uh, there should be a biopic on this guy. I don't know why there's not a movie about his life yet. Um, Again, moving through this pretty quickly, but um, this is a really terrible era. It continues to be a, uh, a terrible era, era in Central Florida. We look at Emmett Till. You're all probably familiar with that story. Um, the reason we feature him is not because he's from Central Florida, but because um, he is one of the catalysts to the civil rights movement. His, his mother, of course, made this very brave choice to have an open casket. Uh, and in several of the oral histories that we've done with individuals, we find that it was actually one of the reasons that led so many young people here to the youth NAACP, because our local civil rights movement was really um, <laughs> very involved with the, with the youth here. This is a picture of the bombing of Harry and Harriet Moore's home in Mims, uh, just about an hour away. Um, you'll notice this theme, yesterday this was home. Yesterday, Akoe was home. Yesterday, Rosewood was home. Yesterday, 
This was home for the Moors. A bomb is placed underneath their home on Christmas, uh, also their wedding anniversary. Um, nobody's ever held responsible for any of these events that I've mentioned. Nobody's ever found guilty or held responsible. Um, Harry and Harriet's family, knowing that they won't be served at the local hospital because they're Black, attempt to take them over an hour away to Sanford. Harry dies on the way and Harriet just days later. Nobody's held responsible, though a floor plan of their home had been shared at a Ku Klux Klan meeting just weeks ahead of time. Both catalysts to the civil rights movement. Again, yesterday this was home. You'll see it's a little bit hard, but there's a cabin in the middle of the room and you'll see parts of it are burnt away. And that's to sort of symbolize this prosperity on one side to this loss on the other. We do go very quickly through the cabin, but I wanna give everybody a fair warning. We have a disclaimer on here. Um, the idea is that um, where does racism start? It starts in the home. Where can it most likely be beaten in the home? And inside this cabin, we have a lot of items that talk about the social situation of race, racism and how people are complicit and complacent in racism. You don't have to wear the robe to support the robe. You can send a racist postcard to your grandmother in the 1930s. You can be one of our many Lions Club members who, who um, go in blackface and, and speak in uh, derogatory parlance to a, a room full of people. You can attend a lynching. You can get a ticket to one. So there is some very difficult imagery inside of this cabin. I just wanna warn everybody, if you would prefer not to engage with this content or see it, please feel free to look away. I'll let you know when we're leaving the cabin, uh, it is difficult. So please make that choice for yourself um, and I'll let you know when we're, we're exiting. Um, but there was a lot of ways that people, again, continue just to let this happen. Again, they might not have thought of themselves as racist, but they, if they weren't speaking up against it and doing that work, then they were complicit in it happening. Um, these are all local situations. Uh, that's a, a picture of a lynching of four men in Ocala. Um, there's a letter there from a person who was visiting on vacation who wrote home that he attended a, a hanging of a black man and he enjoyed it very much. Uh, that was a letter home. Um, I'm going to keep going just to get out of the cabin. This is a, a black Ku Klux Klan robe. And believe it or not, in that cabin, that is actually the high point of the social story uh, in there. That robe was, uh, on, is on loan from the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. And it's uh, the Nighthawk robe of Stetson Kennedy. Now, Stetson Kennedy was a, a white man who could not fight in World War II and wanted to find another way to serve his country. And so he actually infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan, becoming a Nighthawk, which is security, a good place to be if you're trying to watch the ins and outs. Um, and uh, he infiltrated the KKK and actually fed information back out to the Georgia and Florida governments. Um, so that's actually a success story. Um, and he even fed information back to the uh, Superman radio broadcast um, as well. You can listen to an example of in there. Moving around very quickly now, as we are running out of much time, uh, the civil rights movement locally, we talk about a lot of the ups and the downs and the victories. Uh, we talk about sit-ins and wait-ins, uh, some of the different legislature that is eventually passed. Um, going through all of these stories, um, but we start to wrap up some of these themes we talked about, educating, education, voting, property. All of those themes still have a story today. It just looks different. There are still so many issues we have to fix. And that's sort of the idea. We come up through school desegregation. Um, we're still having so many issues. In 100 years, what has actually changed? We start to address where we currently are to give people a frame of reference. Um, we have an excellent uh, item here on loan from the Goldsboro Museum. Um, of course, uh, some, some people don't actually realize that the Black Lives Matter movement started here in Central Florida with the murder of Trayvon Martin. And more recently, again, sorry, it's a hard photo to see. Um, we send staff out to contemporary collect. We collect history as it's happening. We don't wait for the history to be donated to us. We go out and we get it. Um, and this is a photo from uh, a Black Lives Matter movement protest after the murder of George Floyd. And you can't really see, but here in the middle, a young gentleman is holding up a sign for July Perry. 100 years later, what's the relevancy? It is relevant. These themes carry throughout this entire exhibition. We know this is really difficult content. We don't want people to leave this exhibition feeling just depressed and like there's nothing that they can do. We know there's things they can do. And so um, we actually wrap into the end here. You'll see these white cards over on the right. They say, learn, discuss, act, and vote. And those are takeaways that you can grab and take with you. 
There's a book, a reading list about racism. There's uh, questions that you can take home to your family or your friends and discuss about the topics you've seen in this exhibition. We wanted people inspired to action not just depressed in, in, in the terrible past. We need to learn from that past and use it to move us forward. It's a really fast tour through that entire space. Uh, I'm gonna share one last thing before I, I sign off or, or a lot of questions or other um, things. Um, we have an oral history listening station. There are so many people who've lived these histories, right? I'm just a person who writes about them and puts them on the wall. They're not really my stories. Right, there are stories to share, um, but so what we did was to try to make some of these oral histories, these recordings of individuals, more accessible to more people and more interesting. Uh, we worked with a local uh, former Disney animator who illustrated or animated parts of these oral histories for us, um, and so I'd like to share one of those just because it's particularly wonderful. Um, but we did one. Um, there's one second. There's one with uh, Mayor Jerry Demings. Uh, in this section uh, where he talks about his experience as a black man in Central Florida and growing up here. Um, one with uh, a descendant of the Ocoee massacre, one with uh, Mildred Board, who was actually a 10 year old girl at the time the massacre happened. But this particular one I wanna share to sign off um, is with Sammy Jennings. Sammy Jennings was part of the youth NAACP movement here. Uh, he now lives in Washington, DC. We did our oral history over Zoom, which I, is not my favorite way to talk to people, but here we are. Um, and so he just tells these incredible stories about growing up. And this particular story is from when he was 12. And we did this again to make this content, this difficult content, really accessible to our young learners specifically. Uh, but I find that it's inspirational for me and for all of us. Uh, you will note throughout this that the artist actually used archival footage or ar archival photographs to do his sketches. You'll see downtown Orlando and Christmas with the, Kinsan, Kin, the, with the Christmas star. You'll see Winter Park, Greyhound Station and, and others. So I'll play this and then we'll wrap up. It's just a few minutes. My, my wife would call him thrifty, but my, my mother always called my dad stingy. <laughs> Even though he bought me all these Christmas presents and this and that. So anyway, the bus was probably 2 or $3 cheaper than the train. So instead of going on the train to Detroit, which I love, I had to take the Greyhound bus to Detroit. So I got on the bus in Orlando and said four seats from the rear, that was, that was the battle line I had drawn. And I was determined that I was gonna fight it to the end, to death, defending that. And I wasn't gonna move. Again, everybody behind me was black. When we got to win apart, this black girl got on, she was a teenager, I was 12. So she was probably 15 or 16, something like that. And she was going to Detroit too. And so when she got on, we started chatting, and I, and I said, look, I said, you know, the bus driver might tell us to move back, but if he tells us to move, don't move. I said, we have a right to sit here. I said, the law says that when you're traveling in interstate commerce, you cannot be segregated. She said, okay. Everything was cool when the bus rolled on out of Winter Park, and we got to Jacksonville. The bus driver got off and then he came back on the bus and came back to us and said, uh, would y'all please move back to the back? We got some white people getting off. I remember he was a younger guy. Obviously, he didn't have the attitude of this other driver. And so I just gently pressed down on her arm or thigh so she wouldn't move, you know, like, you know, as a reminder. And I looked up at him and I said, sir, we have a right to sit here. I said, we are traveling in interstate commerce. And the law says that we can sit anywhere we want to. Pam, I was scared. We were in Jacksonville. You just mentioned Jacksonville. Jacksonville was like being in Mississippi. He said, well, I got these white people getting on. Would y'all please move? And I just said, no. So he turned around and left. And that's when I was really scared. Because this was right the year after Emmett Till had been lynched. And, you know, all those warnings my grandmother had taught me about talking back and, and being up in it to white people. 
And I and I just I, I didn't know what he was gonna come. They were gonna come back on the bus and kill us. Finally, he came back on the bus, and these white people were trailing him, and he led them to the back of the bus behind us, and they sat down. And I felt a combination of relief, felt vindicated, but I also felt afraid because I didn't know what was going to happen for the rest of the trip to the South, which was all said and did. But that taught me after that trip was over that I could stand up for my rights and survive. So that probably still didn't mean that 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 seed of, of rebellion against the system that really blossomed later in the 60s when I was in high school. Mm. Mm. That's all. That's a wrap. Pamela. Awesome. That, job. that was a, a, an awesome, awesome job. You had a lot of information to cover. And I just encourage, I have not been to the exhibit, I intend to go. I just um, encourage everyone to go and see it. Um, as I said, this is um, not pleasant information, but it is information that we need to know so that we can move forward. And one quick question before I move on, uh, what is the future of the exhibit? Well, um, that is still to be determined. We'll be open through April 4th. Uh, and then we don't know if there'll be a physical life for this exhibition. We're redesigning the whole institution right now. Over the next few years, it'll be all brand new. And so a lot of this information will get infused into the permanent exhibitions. Uh, but our biggest goal uh, right now actually is that we are trying to raise money if anybody would like to donate or know somebody who would like to. Uh, the city just recently gave us $14,000 um, towards the project. Uh, but we want to take all of this and build a long form digital storytelling website platform where we take all of the information from this exhibition and we build it. And I mean beautifully, you know, audio, video, those resources, that landing map. So that in the fulfillment, um, if you don't know, the House Bill 1213, um, which uh, Representative Thompson could speak to more, um, was passed that will mandate the education about Okoe massacre throughout the state. And by creating this website, it creates instant accessibility to the facts about this event and to all of these resources we've already taken the time to amass because quite frankly, teachers have so much to worry about right now. They don't have time to try to figure out this really difficult content too. So we've already written curriculums. We have this youth and family guide. We have all of these resources. Um, you know, if anybody wants to go to the website uh, or know somebody else who might be interested in supporting this, we hope to raise that money and to, to build this all out so that it can be accessible to all of Florida's educators all of our young learners and the entire, uh, quite frankly, the nation and the globe. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for, um, for being here and for, for sharing that exhibition. It was, as I said, it was a lot of information um, that you gave us and we thank you for that. Um, in the essence of time, we'll keep moving on. And our next speaker will be Representative Geraldine Thompson, who will be talking about the, um, the uh, Wells Built Museum, which was the founder and the importance of it uh, in our history here in Orlando. Representative Thompson. Thank you so much. Uh, you just heard uh, Pam talk about sundown towns and you heard her talk about black codes and you heard her talk about Jim Crow laws. Well, the Wells Built Hotel uh, that was opened in 1929 was made necessary because of the Jim Crow laws and because of the sundown towns. Uh, it was the property of one of the first African-American physicians in Orlando. His name was William Monroe Wells. He came to Orlando in 1917 and started a medical practice. He was very busy. There was only one other African-American physician in town, uh, Jeremiah B. Callahan, and between two of them, they had to serve the entire population of African-Americans because white physicians did not treat black patients. Because he was busy with his medical practice, he hired an individual to manage uh, not only the Wellsville Hotel, but the South Street Casino, which was right next door. And the South Street Casino attracted uh, people who were coming entertainers along the Chitlin circuit uh, who were performing one night stands a lot of times. And when they finished performing, they had no place to stay. So they checked into the Wellsville. And I want to share some photographs. I'm focusing tonight on the role of a key woman 
in this whole operation. This is um, Marion Price. He was the person that Dr. Wells hired to manage the South Street Casino and the Wells Built Museum. Marion uh, involved uh, his sister, Pinky Price, as a hostess for both the South Street Casino and the Wells Built Hotel. And I'd like to uh, tell you about Pinky. Pinky was a uh, school teacher. She taught second grade during the day. The Wells Built wasn't uh, open or very active during the day, so she taught school. At night, she also had a sewing school and she taught young people how to make clothing. She was a graduate of Bethune Cookman College at the time where she majored in uh, early learning and, and tailoring and clothing design. And so then she comes back home because she was born in Orlando in 1912. And the photographs that I uh, want you to see will help you to put the Wells Built in a national context. The Wells Built was listed in the Negro Motorist Green Book. And if you saw the Academy Award winning, uh, winning movie Green Book, you know that it was a guide that African-Americans used to identify places where they would be welcome and where they would be safe. And this was because a lot of African-Americans had left the South during the Great Migration. They went to Detroit and other Northern places, but they always wanted to come home to see their families. And so they bought automobiles. The Negro Motorist Grain Book was underwritten by Ford Motor Company. They wanted to entice African-Americans to buy cars and Standard Oil, which was known as Esso, underwrote the Negro Motorist Green Book. Mm -hmm. The Wells Built uh, Hotel was listed in the Negro Motorist Green Book. So whether you were an entertainer, whether you were visiting family out of town, whether you were a dignitary, you checked into the Wells Built Hotel. One of the people that we know very well, and you heard about the Groveland Four, this is where Thurgood Marshall stayed when he came to Orlando to defend the Groveland Four. He could not find a hotel room in Lake County uh, that would rent him a room. So he used the Negro Motorist Green Book and located uh, a hotel in the Paramore neighborhood of Orlando, 40 miles outside of Groveland, and that is where he stayed. Sometimes leaving Groveland, he would see cars trailing him and he would come into the front door of the Wells Built and go out the back door. And he would shimmy through the hedges and run down the street to someone's house so that people didn't know exactly where he was staying. So Pinky was the teacher. She was the uh, instructor at her sewing school and she was the hostess at the Wells Built and the South Street Casino. This was a very popular place for military men because there was a military installment near South Street and Bumby. And it was a segregated military base and the men would come into the Paramore community, which was the black community on weekends or whenever they had leisure time for recreation. So they came to see the big bands, Count Basie, Duke Ellington, Billy Holiday, all of these people who came to the Wells Bill. Nellie is the sister of Pinky, and she's Marion Price's sister as well. And you saw his, um, his photograph. And so the, the Price girls uh, were involved in making sure that everybody was comfortable and that they had what they needed when they were in Orlando at either the Wells Built or the South Street Casino. The sundown town that you heard about in terms of Okoy was a practice throughout the state and throughout the nation where African-Americans would be welcomed during the day to work as servants or cooks or whatever, uh, but you were not welcome to be there at, after sundown. And so you knew that come sundown, you had to find some place to stay. And so the Wells Built was very important because people were very anxious to get out of places like that by sundown and to find a place 
uh, that would be safe for them. And so the wells built uh, played that particular role. Pinky had a sister, Nellie, I already mentioned Nellie, who lived in New York and was a, a cosmetologist in New York. So she would go between Orlando and New York and she made friends. You saw a picture very briefly of Count Macy. That was one of her, her uh, friends. And the picture that you saw was from his funeral that Pinky uh, attended in Harlem at the Abyssinia Church um, in New York. She also frequented Miami and uh, she, sometimes she'd take Nellie, but she was just a very busy person. Pinky got married. She married a classmate from Bethune Cookman and they married in 1948 at Bach Tower. Now that was quite a major event for an African American. Uh, Pinky was friends with uh, Joe Lewis. Uh, she was friends with um, Satchmo. She was friends with Nipsey Russell. Uh, she was friends with Lionel Hampton. And I don't know uh, if we can get the pictures rolling, but there are a lot of autograph pictures wishing Pinky uh, best wishes or, or, or whatever. Her nephew, Dexter, got involved in politics and was hired to work in Washington, D.C. And he was uh, working for Republicans. Republicans at the time were members of the party of Lincoln, where Democrats were launch segregationists. Uh, so many of the people that she was connected with once her nephew went into politics were Republican. And I have uh, an autographed picture from the Republican senatorial inner circle uh, that is written to both Dexter and to Pinky. This was also a, a place for athletes and Muhammad Ali uh, was a frequent visitor to the Wells Built and the young came to the Wells Built. It was a sanctuary. It was a haven during the Jim Crow era. And I told you Dr. King, uh, Dr. Wells came here in 1917. Three years later was the massacre in Okoe. And uh, not long after that, about 30 years later was the bombing of the home of Harry T and his wife, Harriet Moore. And he was in the middle of all of that. And the one picture that you did see was of the ribbon cutting for the Wells Built, we opened in February of 2001. And so February this year, we are 20 years bold. Do we, do we have the pictures for you? Are you able to get them up, Susan? I know you gave us a, a lot of pictures. Yes, I, I did. Yeah, I wanted to, sh to show them. Yeah, well, the, the Green Book, as I said, was important and uh, it was published from 1936 until 1966 after the Civil Rights Act was passed. People could go wherever they wanted and mm -hmm. the Wells Built fell on hard times and was abandoned for 25 years. This is Pinky, Pinky and Andrew Young. Uh, this is at the South Street Casino. Pinky and Joe Lewis. Uh, this is an autograph photo, good luck to Pinky from Lionel Hampton, who is there with Richard Nixon. The senatorial inner circle with the original signatures of the senators uh, from uh, the, the 50s and 60s. This is Count Basie. This is the funeral program that I talked about where uh, she went to Abyssinia in Harlem for his services. A lot of the entertainers were nationally known, but there were a lot of Black Florida musicians who also played uh, and performed at the Wells, at the South Street Casino and lived at the Wells Built and their birthplaces are um, shown on this list. That's Pinky. 
That's Pinky at her sewing school. This is when she got married. Uh, the marriage didn't last very long, but the wedding was beautiful. Uh, that's Pinky in Miami. Pinky uh, at South Street Casino, uh, Muhammad Ali. And he sent, the, the, we have a, his autograph on this particular uh, picture that he sent. These are some of the military men who came into town. They could not congregate on Orange Avenue. Uh, they had to be west of division. Throughout the South, the railroad tracks have separated the black community from the white community. And so Dr. Wells built his hotel just west of the railroad track. But in addition to the railroad track, uh, the city has another line of demarcation that's called Division Street. And this is the ribbon cutting with uh, Commissioner Daisy Lynam. Um, you, you can hardly see the head of Virginia Towns, that's me, and Jerry Purcell in February of 2001. Was that it for you? Yes, uh, I was. I was told the uh, about five minutes. I, All I, right. I, yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, this is, I mean, we are getting history lessons. Um, so interesting to know uh, all of these facts and gives you a deeper, uh, you know, appreciation of where we live and where we've come. And our last speaker is Pasha Baker, who's going to be telling us about the Goldsboro uh, Museum and uh, a native of Sanford, born and raised here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, so. definitely. And it's always a treat to get it from Pam One. Thank you for everything you're doing and congratulations but always a treat and I'm on every conference with Senator Representative Thompson whenever she does her history lessons because what most people don't know is that she started the Wells Built. Mm -hmm. One, two, she's a former educator and still is an educator. I wanna say, I don't think they ever stopped teaching. <laughs> but the reason why she created the Wells Built because it wasn't taught anywhere else. And so that's the reason why you get the history directly from the person that um, took in that history for over 40 plus years. And then she put all of her personal collection into that museum as well. So definitely always a treat to get a history lesson from her. And my name is Pasha Baker. Um, I am the director and CEO of the Goldsboro Westside Community Historical Association Incorporated and encompasses six entities three museums, a few gardens, um, the Paige Jackson Cemetery, as well as the Goldsboro Art Square. And what I am going to speak to you today is about, one, Goldsboro is your second Black Incorporated city right behind Edenville. Um, they were actually founded by two brothers. One brother founded Edenville. His brother, a few years later, founded Goldsboro. And the significance of that is here in Central Florida, not only do you have two all black townships, but they were incorporated where blacks were not only living off the land, but incorporated entire cities in the same way you run a city today. It's the same way you ran a city yesterday with your mayor, your alderman, your collection of taxes, your businesses, all of that, your property taxes, all of that, the same way you do today. So that's one thing I want to point out. And that was in 1891 was the creation of Goldsboro. A few years earlier, 1877 was the creation of Edenville. And so remember when Blacks were emancipated and enslavement ended, 1865. And during enslavement, Blacks were not allowed to read or write. So here you have two Black men, two brothers, blood brothers, creating and organizing and owning businesses and weren't allowed to read or write a few years earlier. That's the significance in the stories that we tell. So one thing I wanna bring up to you, um, we recently did a virtual presentation on the parallels between 1920 and 2020. 
And one of the parallels that stuck out was not only you hear a lot about the pandemic of 1920 and the correlation to that between 2020, but the correlation between Black women. And one thing that um, if you go to the actually Okoye Massacre exhibition, um, you would see a notice that a lot of the women, a lot of the Black women voted in that election in 1920. And the other thing is that there were accounts of that because so many Black women voted, they thought it was a fraudulent election. Just like last year, you had thoughts of a fraudulent election and because so many people voted. But the, also the correlation is you had so many Black women that voted in 1920, but in 2020, here you have a Black woman who is now the Vice President of the United States that broke a glass ceiling because of the women back in 1920. And then you also have the correlation of the ground workers in the organizations like the Stacey Abrams and all of the people and the organizers to help to make that happen. And so there were a lot of coincidences as far as to make America great again. The slogan back in 1920 was make America first. Same coincidences, not same coincidences, but same parallels. And it's where is we on this call and what you've heard throughout this, um, a lot of things where you say history has repeated itself. And it continues to do. And so that's the importance of coming out to all of these museums and knowing the history so it doesn't continue to be that way. And so I just leave y'all with that and I got to get on another call. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll just Thank say, you. if y'all don't you. want a healthy dose of history, don't invite three of us in a room together. <laughs> well, I, <don't> know. <laughs> I just, I, I, I just want to say, this has been amazing. Uh, the history lesson that we've gotten um, makes you want more, really wants to, you, you know, you, you want to delve into it and, and really um, learn more so that we can be more and do more and just make this a better place. You know, it's just, it's time. It's taken a long time and we are not there yet. We have so far to go and it's 2020 and we're still fighting some of the things that we fought in 1920. And um, that is very, it's sad, but it starts with us. It starts with forums like this, uh, with Ruth List of Central Florida having a Zooms like this and information like this and um, to get it out to the people. And so I, Pamela, thank you. Representative Thompson, thank you. Pasha, thank you so much um, for the information for joining us. And now we'll turn it back over to Susan. I just wanna thank all of our guests this evening for presenting. You've given us so much to think about and perhaps continue this conversation additionally to plan other events, to continue this kind of talk. But I just wanna thank you for giving up your time and for all of our participants, thank you for choosing to be here this evening. I know that it was a difficult conversation, but it was a necessary conversation. So we're grateful that you were with us. We hope you'll join us again. And um, we know that it's important that we all be voting, that we be voting to elect women, that we elect women of color. And it's through the exercise of our votes and our work to get these women elected, that we will have a better future for our state of Florida. I know that. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna thank you all for choosing to be with us and thank you to our speakers. We'll see you in March. Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.